so in terms of what what can be done immediately after surgery or immediately after intravesical therapies like BCG, if intercourse with penetration is something that's not immediately on the table because you're recovering from surgery or recovering from a treatment, it's important to remember that patients and partners can still be intimate without intercourse, and that's certainly something that I would recommend to patients in my practice. Patients are also able to achieve orgasm without having a firm, rigid erection. This is something that patients often don't appreciate because erection, ejaculation, orgasm usually happen in close continuity with each other, but they're controlled through completely different systems, and they can occur completely without the other component occurring. There's also the ability of achieving an erection using erectile aids, and I'll discuss some of these. And then certainly there's, you know, the need for preserving erectile tissue using erectile aids and penile rehabilitation in the post-cystectomy period. So there are a whole host of erectile function aids that are available. Starting with the least invasive option, which is usually pills, this is Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. So here, here are sort of representative images of the pills that are out there, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and Stendra is the most recent medication. All of these work essentially the same way. They do require intact nerve function to work in order to give patients an erection. Their utility is in restoring penile blood flow, so even if they're not giving a firm, rigid erection in the post-surgical period, they still have use in increasing blood flow to the penis, so they can still be used as a penile rehabilitative aid. The other medication that can be used is something called an intraurethral suppository. The trade name here is Muse. As you can see, a small suppository is inserted into the urethra using this applicator, um, which is another less invasive option for our patients. Biggest adverse effect here is sometimes patients complain of penile pain, but otherwise this is quite effective. The next device on here is a vacuum erection device. This is a device that patients wear outside the penis. It can be a mechanical device or an electric device, and when activated, creates a vacuum around the penis, pulls blood into the penis, so patients achieve an erection. There's a ring that can be slid down around the penis to maintain blood flow in the penis and maintain the rigidity of the penis uh, for intercourse. We then have penile injection therapy, and this is a penile injection that the patients give to themselves. The medication dose here is very small, the needle is very small, and once the patients get over the actual phobia of the needle, often this therapy is very effective. Unlike the pills, this therapy does not require intact nerve function, so it can be used really any time after surgery in the post-surgical period to achieve uh, an erection that's rigid enough for penetration and intercourse. And then the sort of most advanced or most invasive option is a surgical option, which is implantation of a penile prosthesis. Here we see what's called a three-piece penile prosthesis, but there are malleable prostheses and two-piece prostheses also available. And certainly urologists are happy to provide more information about that to their patients. So one of the things that men who are treated with bladder cancer, really anybody who's treated with any kind of cancer that affects their sexual function, is that they begin to potentially feel some feelings of grief. It's like any other loss. If you uh, lose a person, if you lose a job, if you lose a pet, if you lose a body part, you know, it's different intensities. But if you remember that obviously our sexual function is a, a part of who we are, it's a significant loss, especially if there's uncertainty about how much sexual recovery can take place. So people have written about what the tasks of grief and mourning are, and they um, the following. It's, first of all, it's important to recognize that a change has happened, and it's also important to allow oneself to experience the feelings of uh, loss, such as anger, frustration, sadness, fear, and also hope 
that things will get better. It's important to recognize that sex will not be different and that that doesn't mean that all sexuality and all sexual memories have to be repressed or forgotten because I think if you had a good sexual relationship or if you've been a good lover, you can still be that regardless of what happens to your function as long as you can receive and give pleasure. And so it's, it's better to keep kind of continuity with who you were as a sexual person into the present than to sort of pretend that that was the past and you no longer have to have any contact with it. Sometimes people are fearful of grief because the feelings can be so intense. But grief is very different from depression because it comes and goes and over time it gets better. When a person is feeling sad and kind of desperate and down all the time and cannot motivate themselves to do anything over a period of one or two or three weeks, then maybe a depression is developing. But very intense feelings that come and go are quite normal and get better. So here we have a website. Sometimes people say, I don't know how to be sexual and have my ostomy be visible. This is something that I can do about it. And so there is a website that has a lot, a lot of suggestions and products. And we just selected a couple of products for men and women, too, that can help when being sexually intimate. So I hope you can see these belts that can hide a stoma and can look actually pretty sexy in themselves. What's very important in the sexual recovery after bladder cancer treatment is being able to communicate because now nothing happens so spontaneously. There's a need for preparation. Sometimes there's a need to use AIDS. And so communication becomes very important. And for some people, it's a new skill to learn. We talked about the grief reaction and mourning. It's important to accept that things are going to be different, but they can still be uh, pleasurable and connected. So we can think of it as developing a new version of sexuality where one can learn new sensual and sexual interactions, new ways of pleasuring. And you know, even though one is in one's 50s, 60s, or 70s, they can still learn things, including how to be sexually intimate in a new way. And then, of course, part of it is coming to terms with using sexual aids if that becomes a necessity. So some people feel that it's helpful to have support for their sexual recovery and they come to sex therapy. Your physician can refer you or your primary care doctor can refer you. And there's also a website to help you find a sex therapist in your area. Sex therapists are people who are undergo an education program and they become certified by the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. The American Association for Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists is a website. It's called aasect.org. And if you go there, there's a map of the United States. And if you click on your state, it will tell you all the certified sex therapists in your state. And then you can find one closer to you. Mostly sex therapy is done best in the office, obviously, because you want to be in the office. Some providers will do at least a consultation on Skype. And you might be able to get at least some information just from a consultation, but you may just be able to find a therapist right near you, and that's the website to go to. So when you come to sex therapy, first of all, your sexual concerns will be assessed. Your sexual function will be assessed. And if you're with a partner, your partners as well. And there will be a attention paid to all the biopsychosocial aspects of sexuality, so the function, psychology, the relationship. And it's often helpful to get each person's individual history, if there's a couple, or at least the person's individual history, if it's an individual, 
to learn about how this person has coped with adversity in the past and what other things might affect their feelings about their changed sexual function. Treatment often includes a lot of education about sex. Couples therapy also assess, uh, address not just sexual interactions, but communication and other types of interactions that sometimes can be helpful, or sometimes can be impeding the sexual relationship. So what we look for when a person comes to sex therapy, we obviously want a person to feel like their sexual function is as good as it can be. And then may include feeling competent using sexual aids feeling competent to do sex differently from the way one had done it before. Improve communication because communication becomes quite important. Improve sexual interactions, including expansion of sexual repertoire. So one of the things that Dr. Mehta mentioned before is the importance of blood flow. And blood flow becomes important for us as we age anyway, in every way. You know, we want to have good blood flow to our heart, to our brain, but also into our sexual organs. And sometimes there are ways of stimulating blood flow that not only lead to better and healthier tissues, but also to increase sexual pleasure. Improved self-esteem is important, feeling able to be a good lover regardless of what current sexual function is. And certainly alleviation of symptoms of depression and anxiety if one has been feeling worried or discouraged. So there are some take-home points from our talk today. One is that bladder cancer brings about changes that actually we all face as we age. Loss of spontaneity and loss of some sensitivity that comes with aging, with acquiring health conditions that influence sexual function. At the same time, men and women can be sexual into their 90s if they wish to do that. It's just that sexual interactions change. With bladder cancer, even if there is erectile dysfunction and loss of ejaculation, there are still many things that a person can do. If there's a relationship, there's that and emotional intimacy, sensuality and physical intimacy and orgasmic capacities protected from most people. It becomes more work because it, sexual energy requires being more intentional and more stimulation, but if you think about what the outcome is, it's not bad. As I said before, activities become more intentional, as well as spontaneous, and communication really, really improves sex greatly at that stage. And this is what effective sexuality looks like when one may not have perfect sexual function, but still one can be very, very successful sexually. So one may feel desire to have sex, and then there's a discussion with a partner if there is one to have sex and securing time and space, making sure that it's going to be uninterrupted. There can be arousal with stimulation and the use of erotogenic and erectogenic aids. So erotogenic being maybe vibrators or certainly using a lubricant. And then erectogenic aids that Dr. Mehta uh, mentioned. And if that is negotiated reasonably successfully, it leads to orgasm for both the man and the partner, and then the rest is the same as it was in the past. Well, thank you both so much, Dr. Mehta and Dr. Whitman. This has been a very informative program. We greatly appreciate your sharing your expertise with us. Please be sure that you take a few moments and complete the short survey. Give us some direct feedback. Your opinions about this program are very important to us. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and I hope you all have a nice day.